UT's mission and vision for the future. Our focus, the people, places, and purpose of the university has transformed the UT educational experience and created a legacy of excellence. We are where we are today, one of the most exciting times in UT history because you accepted our challenge. You have helped us transform UT from a local treasure with potential to a prominent national figure on the educational scene. On behalf of our campaign leadership team, we thank you for making so much possible. Because you care, because you believe, UT's future possibilities are unlimited. At the heart of our university are its people, our students, faculty, and staff who come from around the world and from different backgrounds to share a singular experience. Our primary concern is making UT accessible to deserving students and then ensuring their academic progress, personal development, and career readiness. Your support ensures that a UT education remains within reach to exceptional students from across a wide economic spectrum. Currently, 92% of UT's almost 9,000 students receive financial assistance. The Creating Tomorrow campaign is committed to increased student financial aid and academic program development. UT's strong experiential learning program is nationally recognized for the variety and number of experiences that shape our students' lives. My UT scholarships are important because they allow me to focus on my studies and my future without the burden of financial struggles. I am currently a senior and have plans to attend law school next fall. This dream is possible because of the scholarships I've been awarded. Receiving financial aid has given me the time to compete on the cross-country team, become involved in student government, and to volunteer in the community. Each year, my scholarships have motivated me to achieve more academically. Thank you for believing in me. Creating Tomorrow supports an innovative campus that reflects our defining value of educational excellence. We have always considered our campus setting as a resource. The construction of modern buildings and facilities during the campaign has transformed the UT landscape and enhanced the student experience. Projects supported by this campaign inspire a strong sense of community for everyone who lives, learns, and works at UT. It is the exceptional education which takes place beyond the impressive facades of our buildings that helps us attract and retain talented faculty and students. Students have access to the best faculty, facilities, tools, and resources to nurture their passions. Cutting edge technology
It's a beautiful Friday night at Namoli Family Stadium. Tampa is back home for softball. I'm Taylor Storthy, joined alongside Bruce Worsniak for the first of a three-game series between Tampa and Eckerd. Tonight will be the first game, and tomorrow there will be a doubleheader, a classic Sunday, Saturday afternoon where we'll see some action. But the first, and a little bit of a preview, potentially, for tomorrow's action will be tonight. Yeah, the Spartans come in with a 5-3 and three one loss record here so far in 2022 and UT is coming off of a 3 to 2 victory which was the second game in a doubleheader back on Saturday afternoon that was against Valdosta State a game played up in Daytona Beach and on the other side of the field Eckerd comes in with a 2 and 2 one loss record they won their first two games of the season and are looking to rebound after having been swept this past Sunday in a doubleheader against Lander University. And this is actually the first road game of the season for Eckerd. They are based just over the bridge in St. Pete and quote-unquote on the road, even though it's just over the bridge here to Tampa, and taking on the Spartans and getting ready to get started here at the Namoli Family Stadium. 79 degrees, our game time temperature, and Corinne Miner set to start things off in the circle for the Spartans. And leading off for Eckerd will be Brenna Lekinski, and that will be taken for ball one. And Corinne Miner in the circle tonight for the Spartans, and whenever you have Miner on the mound, there is no reason to worry. Miner is a complete athlete doing everything from batting to fielding, and of course, an ace when it comes to dominating from the circle. So far, Miner is 3-1 and one with a 2.55 ERA, and has a chance with a 1-1 one, one count right here. That will fly backwards, and hits off the tarp, so it'll be a foul ball. Can't be a little deceiving from the viewing angle. Well, the tarp does reach out pretty high. One and two counts. And as you were mentioning, Tampa is coming off a win. Eckerd is coming off a loss as another one is fouled off. It's important for Eckerd to try to get a win early here, to try to get a leg up in the series, and to try to get their team back on track. They were able to sweep Ursuline in their first series, but took an 0-2 series to later the next time. There's going to be a line drive down the third base line, and it will be a single for Lekinski. And Eckerd will get on with an early single to open up the ball game. Yeah, a nice shot in the arm there for Eckerd, getting your leadoff hitter on base. And so certainly a good start, especially, as I mentioned, being on the road. And Taylor, as you just said, they're trying to bounce back from having been swept in that doubleheader. So a nice way to start the game for the visitors. That one will be taken from a strike, and exactly that. It's a good start to get someone on base, but Miner deals with the pressure well and knows how to get out of these situations. So it'll be interesting to see if Lauren McGorlis will be able to do anything here. Takes a second one, and it'll be a 1-1 count. Lauren McGorlis is, in, is from Miami, Florida, and a freshman coming out of Miami Palmetto Senior High. Here's the 1-1, one, one, and that will also be taken. Strike two. As like, you mentioned, 79 degrees, a really nice night out tonight. I know some of the previous games we've had, there's been some cooler temperatures uh, alongside some double headers, so the warm weather will certainly be a relief to all the fans and players out here. It'll be a 2-2 count now after that one is taken high. Lexi Chevalier is the catcher for UT tonight and behind her is home plate umpire Steve Lewis with Peter DeRose working the infield. That one will be taken outside for a full count. So far Margulis hasn't swung yet but hasn't needed to and already has Miner in a tough spot. We'll see how Miner deals with it from the circle. The full count pitch takes it ball four and there are now two on with no outs. Two really solid at-bats to open up for the Eckert Tritons. Yeah, and for Lauren Margolis, 
Good patience by her, good eye at the plate, letting that one go low at the knees. And as a result, runners on first and second with no outs in the game that has just begun. So again, a good start here for the Tritons. Now, of course, up is Skylar Reddish hitting in the three spot. And you never want to have multiple runners on base when you're getting to the middle of the lineup. And potentially, in a best-case scenario, you could hope for a triple play. That's probably not going to happen. Here's the 0-1 pitch. That's going to be taken, and that'll be high for ball one. Skylar Reddish is a freshman. This is a very young Eckerd team in terms of underclassmen. And there you see another base hit. So two hits and a walk. And just like that, Eckerd with the bases loaded. He's able to get past Russo and Jansen to get into the outfield. Perkins will get it back in time to prevent any run from coming home. But the bases are now loaded with no outs. And stepping up to plate now will be Kayla Hurley with a chance to potentially get Eckerd on the score line with also not too much pressure with zero outs. It means Eckerd will still likely have another chance or two afterwards. Pressure now in the circle for Miner. Not a great start. But it's not about how you start. It's about how you finish. And the next batter is ready. Here's the 0-0 pitch. It's a swing and a miss there for strike one. Well, and if you're going to bounce back from letting the first three runners on base, you know, this is the way to do it is to get some outs, shift the momentum back over to UT side, and get the Tritons scratching their head. As you see that pitch come in now for a one and one count. And so Corinne Miner trying to take control back of the game. And as I say, if you can strand runners, get out of this inning with little to no damage, it would be collective exhale from the Spartans' dugout. That one's taken for strike two. And so far, Eckerd utilizing very good patience and discipline to get themselves into great batter's counts and put pressure on Miner. But a 1-2 count has a chance for Tampa's first out. That will be taken outside, 2-2. And, two and, two. and Miner hasn't really been able to capitalize with getting into these early counts. And that's a reason that Eckerd have gotten better pitches later in at-bats to get runners on base. And now, with the bases loaded, here's the 2-2 pitch. Swing and a miss. That's going to be strikeout number one for Corin Miner. And a little bit of an exhale with two outs to go in the inning. One out so far. Brooklyn Cardona will now step up for Eckerd. Bases loaded. Still very dangerous, but not as dangerous as that situation with zero outs. Yeah, so we're at the number five hitter now. And that's what I was saying is that if Corin Miner is able to get a couple outs here, as you saw with the strikeout, Leave those runners stranded. It's not the way you want to start the game, but if nobody crosses the plate, it's no harm, no foul, and move on to the bottom half of the first. But still, obviously, work to be done with only one out right now. And that one will be taken for strike one. And exactly that, that's going to be the goal to try to get out of this inning. And if there is no run scored, there is no issue. The only thing that's hurt is the pitcher's walk, sits, and innings pitched. And that being said, as long as you're not allowing runs, that's not the most important thing. That'll be taken for strike two. A 1-2 count now and a potential to try to get two outs here. We saw Cardona try to set down a bunt early in the at-bat. Wonder if she's going to try to do so as well with the 1-2 count. That one will be taken. Just high for ball two. This is where you slowly start feeling things potentially turning if Corinne Miner could get the strike out here. The doubt might creep into the mind of the Tritons hitters. And that one will be taken inside. And with a full count here, that's exactly it. You've got some doubt for both sides. For Eckerd, it's can we get this offense going? And for Miner, can I get out of this? That one's fouled away. So the payoff pitch will be up next again. 3-2 count. Miner already over 20 pitches so far. But Miner is a workhorse in the circle. Miner comes in and rarely leaves, meaning she can go the distance. So that's not going to be a problem. That one will also be fouled off. And you got to give credit there to Brooklyn Cardona for battling through this at-bat. 
staying alive here in the top of the first with the bases loaded and hoping to reach base in whatever fashion she can. And here's the 3-2, and it will be taken, and the first run is scored for Eckert off a walk. And you know what? Walks aren't the prettiest things in all of baseball, but as Billy Bean said, as long as you're getting on base, you're doing something right. And that logic applies exactly to softball, as Eckert has taken the lead with just two hits and two walks, a perfect inning apart from the strikeout so far, and the Tritons are looking to get back going. And if you haven't seen Moneyball or read the book, it's a great film. And here's the 0-0 pitch that's going to be taken inside for ball one. And needless to say, there's nothing that Corinne Miner would love now more than a double play. Really try to limit the damage here. That one's going to be grounded to short. The throw home for the force out. And that will do the job to get two outs now. A smart play with the fielder's choice and no attempt to two. Don't want to risk an error and getting another run home. So now two outs and the bases are still loaded. And I saw L Lauren Margolis on her way back to the Eckerd dugout, spending some time talking with Megan Diaz, who you see coming up to hit here, obviously giving her some insight as to what she saw from Corinne Minor when she was at the plate. And that's the important thing as well. Your teammates will always be able to give you the insight on how a pitcher is able to work from the circle. Say, okay, they usually like to attack with this. Watch out for this one. This really fooled me. And the, potentially that's been what's helping them so far. As there's a 1-0 count, this one's taken down the heart of the plate for strike one. Well, the other thing, too, is as Margolis worked her way around the bases, she had a different vantage point to watch and see Corinne Minor working from the circle. So, as I mentioned, some tips that she's able to pass along to her teammate. And that one is taken high and outside. And again, I can't stress enough how good the discipline has been so far for Eckerd. They're not swinging too often. They're working great counts and getting themselves good opportunities. And it has worked. Here's the 2-1. That one is going to be taken inside and down low for strike two. At a 2-2 count, a chance for Miner to limit the damage here from the circle and get out of the inning. 2-2 pitch with two outs right here. Swing and a miss. It's a second strikeout for Miner, and the side is retired. One run comes home off two walks and two hits, and the bases are left loaded. And I'll tell you what, you know, for the Spartans, you're going to say, well, it's great that we only gave up one run, and you're going to feel good about stranding the bases loaded but at the same time if you're Eckerd even though you only got one run you got one run and you got to Curran Minor right in the very first inning so it's a shot of confidence for them early on being on the road playing a, a perennial powerhouse UT and saying this is the ace of the Spartan staff Curran Minor and we were able to load bases we were able to get a run across we were able to get a couple of hits against her so yes it's disappointing to not get more runs across, but I think if you're Eckerd, you got to start off feeling good about yourself with what you just did in the very first at-bat for the team. Exactly. They were able to get the job done, get a good start, and get Miner a little bit shaken from the circle because it's never good, never a good feeling when you're pitching to let up walks and actually concede a walk through, or a run through a walk. That's one of the worst feelings you can have where you were able to work a full count but because you just can't bait the swing and can't place the pitch, the run comes home, and that's just on you. Yeah, and certainly you want to try to get into the pitcher's head. So if you're Eckerd, you're wanting to have a really strong defensive inning right now and say if we can get the Spartans out, three up, three down, we're right back to bat. And then Corinne Miner just might be scratching her head a little bit when she walks out to the circle for the start of the second inning and say, wow, these guys are up to bat already and I need to bring something different that I didn't have working in the first inning. And we'll see if Tampa can capitalize. Alongside an RBI. Spartans will be looking for more of the same from Perkins here on the 0-0 pitch. 
That'll be taken. Strike one. And a good job here for Perkins to get ahead in the circle. That one will be taken. A 1-1 count. That's going to be popped into the infield, and as it is caught very cleanly, the first out will be right here. Perkins not able to get on base as Fantone will now step up. So now Lauren Fantone ready to go, hitting in the two slot. That is going to be a drive deep to the outfield. It's going to get down in the gap for extra bases. A double and going to third. It is a one out triple. And what a play there from Lauren Fantone. Getting a great hit right there. Sailing it all the way to the wall. And it now brings up Mariah Galehouse with a runner. Just one base away. And that's the shot in the arm that the Spartans needed, which, as I mentioned in the top half of the first, Eckerd got it with putting runners on right away. And so certainly for UT to all of a sudden get a leadoff triple, that's a huge shift in momentum that carries over from retiring the Tritons in the bottom of the first and escaping with only one run on their side of the scoreboard. Tampa looking to continue that success as Gullhouse is able to get herself ahead 2-0 in the count. But it might not be the safest play to try to walk Gullhouse as Corn Miner is up next and is just as deadly as a hitter as a pitcher. So, a lot of pressure now as the count is 3-0 in the on the circle for Perkins. A chance for Gullhouse to get on base. And Gullhouse will is able to Actually, no, it's going to be taken inside for strike one. Gallhouse disappointed with that one. And the 3-1 count here. Gallhouse has been electric so far for the Spartans, hitting 280, getting on base 280 with 400 slugging. Gallhouse will take that inside and will get on base for the walk. And this sets up nicely for Corinne Miner, as you mentioned, who is just as potent with the bat as she is from the pitching circle. And here she finds herself in a position to really help her own cause as she comes to the plate with runners on the corner and only one out here in the bottom of the first, an opportunity for the Spartans to tie the game up. Miner hits 3-4-8, has been able to get on base 4-4-4, and has also slugged 3-9-1 with three RBIs. So in this type of situation, Miner is the exact type of player you want at the plate. And is able to take ball one and get ahead in the count again. And we saw Miner struggling to get early leads and counts in the first. And similar things here in the circle from Perkins. And Gallhouse will steal second very well as the count moves to 2-0. Oh. Yeah, I actually had my eye on her, and she looked like she was ready to go from first base and got such a good jump that the catcher just decided that it wasn't even worth it to try throwing down to second. Now UT with two runners in scoring position. And alongside the two runners in scoring position, it's a 3-0 count. And the catcher will head to the circle. Just trying to give a little bit of words of motivation or maybe an idea of what Perkins should try to do. As this is a very dangerous spot that could load the bases and bring up Alexa Russo. And Russo is also a very clinical hitter, especially when the bases are loaded. So with one out here, a 3-0 pitch. Perkins trying to avoid another walk. And that is going to be taken for strike one. And the 3-0 pitch is usually a gimme. You usually take it because if it just misses, it's a walk. If you don't, you still have two more strikes to work with. So the 3-1 here to Miner. Miner's going to drive that to left field. The Spartans will tie. They can potentially take the lead. Gullhouse gets home and scores. Miner gets in with a 
two-run double. And now with one out, the Spartans have taken a 2-1 two two lead. Holsters the imaginary sword. Miner does exactly what she wanted to do, avenge the one run conceded by scoring two of her own. Yeah, what an amazing turnaround from what we saw in the top of the first inning. Tampa looking at bases loaded for the visitors, and all of a sudden they not only get themselves out of that jam, but have their first at-bat, and all of a sudden are up 2-1 to one with only one out still here in the bottom of the first inning, and Corinne Miner standing on second base. So with the 0-1 here, that is going to be taken just outside for ball one. And Russo's already had some good RBIs. The middle of the lineup has come up for the Spartans in the exact spot it's needed to with the right players on base to be deadly. There's a drive to right field. That'll go foul, but it's very well tracked down. It's a great play there from Cardona as Miner will advance to third. Yeah, it was a good heads-up play defensively by Brooklyn Cardona on the run to make that catch. And the Tritons can exhale a little bit now with two away, although on the play, Corinne Miner does advance to third base. So a chance here to see if Savannah Miller can come through for the Spartans and bring Corinne Miner home. The old pitch. And that will be, of course, a take just in time. Went around, but not enough. As the home plate umpire needed to consult his colleague, it'll be a 1-0 count. So the pressure will be on Perkins in the circle to try to get out of this. That'll be fouled backwards. 1-1. One, one. I'll tell you what, the excitement from Corinne Miner when she reached second base. I think that really was her putting an exclamation point on leaving the first inning behind her and taking control offensively and presumably defensively, at least in terms of her mindset, when she returns to the circle for the second inning. And for Miner, it's unsurprising to see her be able to respond and recover so quickly from that setback. She's been Tampa's strongest player over the past few seasons. And with that double has already been able to do so much for the Spartans as Miller is able to work now a two and two count. So Perkins trying to get out of this inning. Two, two right here with two away. That's going to be fouled back. Still two, two. It's interesting, Taylor, when you look at the pitch counts because here's Tampa that's gone up two to one on the scoreboard and really not a whole lot of work from the pitching circle for Hannah Perkins in terms of her pitch count whereas we did see Curran Miner throw an awful lot in the first inning and yet Eckerd only has one run to show for all that. And that's the thing as well. Miner can work so long into games and rack up so many pitches and still be at the top of her game from the circle. So even if you're able to get Miner to 60, 70 pitches by the third or fourth inning, it's not going to change the way Miner plays. She's still going to be just as deadly from the circle as anyone else. Now the full count, it's going to be popped to the outfield and easily corralled just on the edge by Soterakis. So, Sarah Sotorakis is able to make the final play there and retire the side for Tampa. But Tampa already did the damage and lead 2-1 to the end of the first. This is the University of Tampa. Explore your dreams. Discover your talents. Get ready to invent, innovate, and be a leader. This is the University of Tampa. To the wind. Running outside is a dark little door. Being the man in the animal. The man who runs the soul. And turns his distant show. There ain't no end game. Break down the garden gate. There ain't much time after day. Yeah. 
I love the music that plays over the PA sometimes as we are back for the second inning of action between Eckerd and Tampa. Tampa was able to have a strong bottom half of the inning to make up the one run deficit and now lead 2 1. Curran Miner still on the mound and ready to go in the circle for the Spartans. Sarah Sotorakis will lead off the top of the second for Eckerd. We just saw Sorakis make a good play in the infield. And Sorakis will try to do the same in the batter circle. So it means that we have the eight, nine, and one hitters coming up this inning. And three runs between the two teams combined in the first inning alone. The home team leading two to one. That one will be taken for strike one. And Kern Miner had a solid first inning from the circle, was able to retire the side with two strikeouts, but also conceded two hits and two walks. One of the walks drove in a run. That's a good pitch right here, but it's going to be taken for ball one right here, a 1 1 count. And it's a different mentality of style of play. Tampa have been more aggressive taking less pitches and going for more swings, and it has given them some really solid hits. While Eckerd, they've used discipline well, worked themselves great counts, and have still been able to capitalize with two walks and two hits. But now a one-two count, Miner a chance to retire the first batter here. That one's gonna be taken. It was a good breaking ball, but didn't fool Sertorakis. And Taylor, you mentioned the first inning. You do see good patience from these Eckerd hitters. Sarah Sotorakis, very calm in the batter's box. That one is going to be flied to second and will be played very cleanly by Russo to retire the first out of the inning. So Briel Benefield now step up for record. I apologize. It's actually the lefty from Miami, Hannah Burge. Burge will take the first pitch here, 1-0. That one's taken for 1-1. So a 1-1 one, one count here. That one's going to be fouled off into the bullpen. Burge staying alive here with one out and a different look this half inning for the Tritons after they were very successful in the top half of the first. And Burge would love to get on base here and get them Another opportunity for base runners. They had plenty of that in the first. Burge looking at a 2-2 count right now. The 2-2 here for Burge. And that is going to be grounded straight to minor. And it'll be a simple play to first with two away. And I think the biggest difference from the first and second inning for her and minor on the circle has been getting ahead in the counts. She's been able to draw a 1-2 count both times, and that gives the pitcher so much power to work different breaking pitches and to try to force a strikeout or bad contact like we've seen both times. So now, stepping up to the plate will be Brenna Lekinski, and that'll go down the middle, strike one. Lekinski, the Leadoff hitter, she singled in the first inning. And that one's going to be taken for strike two. And Curran Miner, a chance to go one, two, three here with an 0-2 count and two outs. The 0-2, and that one's going to go just a bit too high for everyone, including Chevalier. One, two here now, and still in control. And a polar opposite from last inning, Kern Miner being able to get ahead in every single count. 
and have the control right here. That one's going to be taken, ball two. The 2-2 with two outs in the bottom of the second. Two hits for both teams and Tampa leading 2-1. That'll be grounded foul. Brendan Lokinski is staying alive here. Trying to keep this Tritons at bat going a little longer and hopefully bring up the number two hitter so they don't waste the top of the order. And that is going to be a foul ball. That just goes too far. Not going to be able to be tracked down by Fantone. Fantone with good legs there to try to reach it. But just too far for, for her and anyone else. So, Miner only 37 pitches entering this last at bat. That will be taken for ball three. And I think Lekinski thought there was a 3-2 count already, looking ready to get to first. But nope, there's still the payoff, full count pitch. That's going to be driven deep to left. And that will be foul. Yeah, Brenda Lukinski making good contact here. Just needs to keep it in play. And the Tritons may well find themselves with a base runner this half inning after all. Lukinski's going to ground it to short. The play will reach first in time, and the side is retired. One, two, three. And for Curran Miner, it's a lot better. Nearly the polar opposite of the first inning. And for the Spartans in the bottom of the second, we're going to see the seven, eight, nine hitters, Lexi Chevalier, Emily Jansen, and Steph Ballmer, as they will try to add to their lead and give Curran Miner a little bit more run support since it's now become a case of which Eckerd team plays the rest of the game? The team that showed up at the plate in the first inning and really put the bat on the ball and got themselves a run, or is it going to be the team that we just saw that went three up and three down? And, of course, UT wants to take control of this game, and one way to do that is speak right now with your bats and try to get back to the top of the order, get some runners on base, and try to pad this lead a little bit. That's exactly going to be Tampa's mission, Bruce. But also what's going to be huge as well is how Perkins can react in the circle. After getting that one run lead to start out, she conceded two off some pretty strong hits from the Spartans. So her mission is to try to do what Miner did and respond with a 1-2-3 inning of her own. So entering the bottom of the second, Tampa still leads 2-1. And Chevalier, of course, will be stepping up here to lead off the bottom of the second. And Chevalier has been so consistent as being the starting catcher throughout her Spartans career. And once again, continues her impressive amount of games played streak and games started streak tonight. Chevalier always likely to have fans in the stands rooting her on mean that she's a local girl from Valrico, played her high school ball at Bloomingdale, and so just a traffic dependent maybe 30 minute ride from that part of town to come here to the Namoli Family Stadium as she follows the first one back. And it's always great, Bruce, to have fans here be able to cheer you on, and there are quite a few fans for Tampa, and even some for Eckerd as well, that have made the Made the not super far trek to the Moli Family Stadium to see this one. There's a swing and a miss, so Chevalier down 0 2 immediately. The 0 2 here from Perkins. Swing and a miss, strike three. Perkins will be able to retire the first batter in three pitches. And as tough an at-bat as that is for Lexi Chevalier to go down so quickly, as you were mentioning, it's a real shot in the arm for Hannah Perkins to get off on the right foot to start this half inning and try to keep her team in this game and not let it get away from her. As you see the first pitch followed back there by Emily Jansen. 
and the shot in the arm might be all Perkins needs to respond from the circle and already ahead again 0-1 in the count. Here's the 0-1. Jansen will take it and it will be a ball just outside 1-1. One one. The 1-1 here from Perkins. That is going to be an infield flyout that is very nicely recovered by Lekinski. Emily Jansen just got under that one too much and a routine pop out. And very quickly, Eckert already finding themselves in command here with just one more out. They can dodge a bullet and get back to work at the plate. So a nice rebound here for Eckert so far compared to what they saw in the bottom of the first from the Spartans. And that one will be taken for the 0-1 count and yeah, Perkins has done what she's needed to do from the circle so far, getting the first two batters out in quick succession and now has an 0-2 count on the final out right here. Bomber could go down in three pitches in what would be a very quick and very efficient inning for Perkins. Yeah, very economical with her pitches, Hannah Perkins. As compared to the pitch count that started to get up there a little bit already for Corinne Minor, although at the end of the day, those stats go out the window. It's the one that's on the scoreboard that means the most, and right now it's 2-1 to one in favor of UT. The 1-2 here for Perkins and Balmer. Balmer swings and a miss on the riser, and the side is retired. Both teams find no semblance of offense in the second inning, going 1-2-3 and 1-2-3. Speaking of... Leading off the top of the third for the Eckerd Tritons is Lauren Margolis. And Margolis so far was able to draw a walk in her first plate appearance. Miner in the circle trying to open up the inning the same way she was able to last time. And gets in ahead in the count 0-1. Lauren Margolis is one of four players on the Eckerd roster from Miami. And the Miami native will foul that away, 0-2. And, and that's always great when you have a bunch of players from the same location, same region. It allows them to develop chemistry, know each other, and potentially they might have been high school teammates or played together on travel teams and such and already have that the ability that they know each other and could potentially even be friends. That one's taken down low for ball one. And the majority of the Eckerd lineup is from Florida, but we have a few other players from Arkansas and California and Maryland as well. Here's the one-two. It's going to be taken high. Two and two. Yeah, we don't have a radar gun, but it looks like Corinne Minor, like her speed is actually improving as the game goes along. And that could be bad news for the Eckerd Tritons. The two-two right here. That one's going to be sent deep to left field but it'll be tracked down by I Fantone. And that'll be the first out. Now batting number 11, Skyler Reddish. 
Exactly as you said, Bruce. If you have a pitcher that's able to heat up from the circle as time goes on, it's bad news for the other team. And for Eckert, they're saying, we've already got like 50 pitches on Miner. Why is the pitches now going faster than the first at bat? Yeah, that one right there was pitch number 52. So Miner's pitch count is getting up there. But she has settled down considerably from the first inning. So the 1-0 here, that'll be taken for strike one. And that was, I think, the first time in the past inning or so that Kerr Miner hasn't been able to get the 0-1 lead in a count. She's definitely changed up the way she pitches from the circle after letting up those walks and hits in the first. And now is able to get ahead 1-2 and two on the swing and miss from Skylar Reddish. The one-two here to try to get two outs. Reddish will get under that. And Emily Jansen will put the second out away with a nice catch. And this is a tough spot for Eckerd to be in, using their two, three, and four hitters to start off this inning. And all of a sudden, here is that cleanup hitter, and there's nobody on base, and there's two outs. So certainly, they're going to be looking here to see if Kayla Hurley can reach base in some fashion and keep this at-bat going for Eckerd as the game suddenly has started to move rather quickly after a long first inning from both teams. A very quick third inning as well indeed. And that one's going to be taken, however, 2-0. and Hurley with a good eye to start out her at that. Hurley did go down swinging last time with a strikeout. That one's going to be taken for ball three. So as I was just saying, it had been a while since Miner fell behind in the count, and that's exactly what's happened right here. A 3-0 pitch with two outs. And that will be taken for strike one. That was lower in the corner. And now the 3-1 from Miner from the circle to try to retire the side. Or a oh, walk. That will be taken for ball four. Well, and Kayla Hurley hung in there long enough, and it paid off. And she's able to draw the walk and extend the inning as Brooklyn Cardona comes up to bat here. She walked in the first inning and showing bunt there. That will be taken for strike one. And yeah, interesting to go for the bunt with two outs. But from the left batting lefty, you do have, I'd say, an extra step or two on the run to first base. The one here, that will be taken on the corner for the 0-2 count. That might have been just a little bit outside. But we do yeah, have a slightly worse angle up in the booth. I was going to say, this is not the best angle if you're trying to call it fairly because to me that one was a, was a strike that, or excuse me, it was a ball that he called a strike and now that one there didn't look too far different. Nonetheless, one and two though. And so good to see. Corinne Miner, she was ahead in the count there, now goes to two and two, and trying to close things out here in the top of the third, what with Eckerd having a runner aboard down at first base, and the person of Kayla Hurley. And that will be fouled away by Cardona, and after that one, that was a borderline ball, that was a strike, the two next ones were clearly a bit further outside, and it does bring the count up to 2-2 two -two after the foul as well. Well, and home plate umpire Steve Lewis has the best seat in the house, so we have to defer to his view and his authority. The foul balls are the easiest calls, though. Just foul. The count stays the same. Two and two here with two outs and a runner on first. Eckert still only with two hits so far, but three walks. The 2-2. Two -two. That will be flied to third, and the diving catch not being able to be made, but great hustle there from Siegel to lay it all on the line. But unfortunately, 
Just comes up, I think, a couple inches short with the glove. Yeah, Abby Siegel disappointed, obviously, to make such a valiant attempt and then come away empty. But That's it is the kind of hustle that you like to see from your players nonetheless. Exactly. That's the type of effort you love to see. And the at bat is still being kept alive, so a great job by Cordona, who was able to draw a walk last time. And, you know, a year from now, two years from now, you're going to see Abby Siegel make that catch regularly. It just comes with experience. 2-2 two -two here. That'll be lined to short and easily put away. The side is retired. The top of the third has been finished. One runner was able to get on from a walk but got stranded. So UT is in the driver's seat in a roundabout way here. I mean, obviously a lot more softball still to be played tonight, but that first inning, Taylor, is a distant memory for the Spartans at this point. It's been good to see them kind of shake that off and remind themselves this is our field, this is our home game, and let's play Spartan softball and go out there and take control back of this game, which is exactly what they've done, and set themselves up nicely here to come up to bat with what's going to be the one, two, and three hitters to start off the bottom of the third. So that means that we're going to see Avery Perkins followed by Lauren Fantone and Mariah Galehouse. As you see, the warm-up pitches finishing up out there in the circle from Hannah Perkins. And Perkins, as I mentioned, though, she has been efficient with her pitches thus far, only a pitch count of 25 through two innings. And getting ready to go to work here in the bottom of the third on what has been a very nice night for softball here in Tampa. And it certainly has, Bruce. It's gotten a little bit darker, but that's what we've got the lights for. To make sure the field stays bright and all the action is still very, very visible. And as we were mentioning the pitch count for Perkins, those 25 pitches in two innings were less than Miner had in the first. We already saw that happen, I think, with a diff different minor start in the year. But that just shows the pitching style and sort of swinging attempts and di discipline style for both teams. But now leading off will be Perkins, who's been hitting great so far this season. Tries to go for a bunt, but it's going to be strike one. Speaking of the nice weather, a reminder that tomorrow these two teams will play here a doubleheader starting at 1 o'clock. So we encourage everyone to come out and support the team in person. And if you're not in the area, we thank you for watching and invite you to join us again tomorrow. As you see, a close play at first, but Eckerd able to get the out there. And Perkins there had a good hit, was able to ground it to short and nearly beat out the throw to first. But the throw won by a couple steps. So one out. Yeah, nice hustle by Avery home. Perkins down the first baseline. And that's similar cases to what I mentioned with Abby Siegel trying to make the catch in foul territory, drifting over from third base, is that Avery Perkins continue to work at that, and you're going to beat out more of those throws than not the longer that you go into your softball career. So a good eye here from Fantone to take ball one. That is going to be lined to first base, and what a reaction from Lauren Margulis. And that will be the second out. And that was a very well hit ball. And so Margulis with a great play right there. Lauren Margulis with a tremendous, tremendous catch. And that's how alert that you have to be at any one of these positions. We unfortunately saw a pitcher get hit in the face mask and that's why you have to be so attentive and so ready with the glove, so ready with your decisions, so ready to know which base you're going to if there's runners on base. And Lauren Margolis, wow. So far, Margolis might have the defensive play of the game. Obviously, there's a lot more softball to be played, but really great stab by Margolis playing that first base bag. Yep, and that's split-second reactions, almost something out of the matrix there for Margolis. The 2-0 now count for Gallhouse. Gallhouse was walked on the last time she was able to step up. That time it's going to be taken for strike one. So Perkins able to be a little more aggressive against Gallhouse from the circle this time around. 
And Gallhouse, of course, has been so dangerous from the batter's box. But that time, it's just going to be fouled away. Two and two counts. A chance to also be able to go one, two, three for Perkins. As it would also be a very quick third inning with only one runner getting on. But the 2-2 count, Gauhaus trying to stay alive. That's going to be taken for ball three, and we've got ourselves a full count. Mariah Gauhaus with the bases empty here, but chance to keep the inning alive, which would bring up Curran Minor, a cleanup hitter. And that one will be lined very hard to left and also very foul. But a good job to stay alive from Gallhouse. And an interesting thing about her stat line so far this season, that walk she had earlier in the game was her first of the season, and she potentially could be able to draw a second one here with another full count pitch from Perkins in the circle. The 3-2 now. Gullhouse will line it to second base. A great effort on a good play by Sotorakis. The side is retired. The inning is over. One runner was stranded in the top, no one on the bottom. Still 2 1 Tampa Spartans. Welcome to the University of Tampa. My name is Tucker Whitman, and I'm a junior marketing major here at UT. Today we're going to look at some of the highlights of our beautiful Riverside campus here in downtown Tampa. We'll start at Plan Hall. This historic building was opened in 1891 as the Tampa Bay Hotel, and now serves as the main academic building here at UT, with four floors of classrooms, as well as faculty and administrative offices. Next up, the Vaughn Center, the hub of campus life and activities. This multi-purpose building includes the campus bookstore, our primary cafeteria plus an additional food court, a theater, as well as offices and meeting rooms for student organizations. The Vaughn Center is also one of UT's residence halls, providing five floors of student rooms. Morsani Hall is another residence hall here at UT. In addition to housing approximately 450 students, this building offers another selection of eateries as well as a small grocery store. Now let's check out the Sykes College of Business. This academic building houses classrooms and faculty offices for UT's undergrad and graduate business students. This building also has a real-time stock trading room. Right next door is the Sykes Chapel for Faith and Bad. This gorgeous interfaith chapel features a large main hall. And we are back for the top of the fourth inning. If you've been tuned in here on Tampa Spartans TV, you've definitely enjoyed your share of offense and defense on display. A very active first inning for the batters and a very active second and third for the pitchers. Kern Miner opens up from the circle with ball one here, taken to open up top of the fourth. Kern Miner now has reached 70 pitches on the day. And it's just absolutely crazy to see how Miner can keep working so hard for so long. It doesn't look like she's breaking a sweat out there. That one's going to be taken inside for strike one. Yeah, that's exactly it. Corinne Miner just has such tremendous composure in the circle. You would never know what the score of the game is, whether it was 10-1 to 1, her team is winning or 10-1 to 1, her team is losing. Just very, very in control at all times in the circle. That one's going to be grounded to Corinne Miner. Fields it. It got her out at first. And that was basically like a tie. I... I would need to consult a replay to see that. Great reactions after a guest pass minor and then the throw. But honestly, I think she was safe. And the irony is that they always say the tie goes to the runner. And that was so close. That was so close that you're almost inclined to give it to the runner. And it's a good thing that there isn't a replay. Otherwise, that's, there would certainly be some second looks being had right now at that one. But, you know, the Spartans, they dodge a bullet there. And for Eckerd, you have to say, where is what we had in the first inning? And that's got to be so painful for Janice Casanis. Because Casanis did nothing wrong in that play. Hit a good ball that got by the pitcher and got to first base, like at the same time as the throw. Ugh. So yeah. after that painful play for Eckerd, Diaz down 0 and 2, be able to take it up high for ball one. Yeah, you're exactly right, though. Janice Casanis, you got to feel for her because she ran as hard as she could. And, you know, it obviously helped that the ball went off of Corinne Minor. 
but just Lady Luck wasn't smiling on the Tritons as she reached first base. As you see the strike out there for Diaz, and just like that, there's already two away for Eckerd. Diaz was retired very quickly by Curran Minor. So a chance again to go one, two, three, as a bird is able to pass over the field. Even the wildlife love to get into these games and see some of the action. I'll be taken for strike one. Sotorakis is back up to the plate. So far, Sotorakis is 0 of 1. I'm trying to get her first time on base right here. That's fouled away for strike one. And it's going to be interesting, Taylor, as this game goes along to see the adjustments that Eckerd makes because their bats have really fallen silent since the first inning. And when Lady Luck doesn't smile on you with the call at first, you eventually have to change something, and that's not going to be it there as very routinely caught for out number three. So Balmer is able to catch it and retire the side. It's a 1-2-3 inning for Tampa as they now get ready to go back out to bat. And as much as I say that, that Eckerd's going to make some adjustments offensively or they're going to have to, you know, let's not pretend that Tampa is firing on all cylinders here because their bats have not necessarily exploded over the last couple innings either. So here's an opportunity now where Corinne Miner has found her rhythm in the pitching circle. UT does have the lead, but it's just a one-run lead. So this is the time to go to work and say, before Eckerd makes those adjustments, as much as we have confidence in our pitcher, let's just give her the run support that she needs in case the Tritons do break through a little bit. And it has to start here in the bottom of the fourth, which will see Corinne Miner herself leading off from the number four spot. And then she'll be followed at the plate by Alexa Russo and Savannah Miller. As you see, Hannah Perkins out there finishing her warm-up pitches and Corinne Miner. Kern Miner will be leading off and the best run support, if you're really desperate to look for it, is to just do it yourself. And if you're a player like Curran Miner, that's actually easier done than said from time to time. Curran Miner is able to get a two RBI double that was able to bring home both Spartan runs so far in her first at bat. And here is hoping for some similar success, although the bases, of course, are empty for the start of the top of the fourth. And from the circle, Perkins, after that first inning, has been able to retire two Tampa innings in order with no one allowed on base. Perkins will be hoping to do the same here. Miner is hoping that she'll be able to get on base. And only 35 pitches thrown so far for Hannah Perkins, so technically just under 12 for the first three innings, 12 per inning for the first three, as you see Miner with the out there. And so again, she makes very quick work of a Tampa batter. So pitch 36, as we just mentioned, Bruce was just lined very nicely to short. And very quick work of Kerr and Miner indeed. Miner might feel that definitely wasted that at bat and an opportunity to try to start things off. But Russo is now up to try to avenge Miner. That one's going to be taken for ball one just outside. And Alexa Russo flied out in foul territory to right field in her first at bat and looks like she's going to be retired here also as you see the nice stretch by the first base player Lauren Margolis and I think Margolis that was not as close as the one that could have gone either way but I think the umpire with the emphatic out call was almost trying to send a message to Lauren Margolis, you're going to be rewarded here for that stretch on this play. Yep. And that throw, Bruce, definitely came in well in time to record the out. Off a great play to get it in time because that was a ball that nearly got to the outfield line. And Russo was able to nearly beat it out as well. So, either way, taken for strike one here as Miller is back up. Yo, one. Miller is going to get it past the pitcher. 
Miller's legs. Out. Not in time to beat the throw. So good work by Eckert to once again go one, two, three. And also a very quick inning pitched as well from Perkins. That is the end of the fourth inning. Still no change to the score. 2-1 Spartan lead. fun oh yeah across yeah oh we are back for now the top of the fifth inning well past the halfway point Curran minor still in the circle as expected when minor starts a game she very rarely doesn't finish it only if things go disastrously wrong which again is a big rarity for minor as well would you ever see or get pulled for a reliever Burge is going to lead off here for Eckerd and we'll take strike one. And that is pitch number 80 for Miner, who was able to deal with the fourth inning a lot quicker than the previous ones. Hannah Burge 0 for 1 in this game. And the 0 1 to her there is another strike for Corinne Miner, really feeling herself now. Definitely settled in and found the groove. So the 0-2 here for Burge. That will be taken outside for ball one. So once again, Miner able to get ahead in the count once more. Burge last time up was out. Trying to avoid the same fate here. Here's the 1-2. That will be fouled away. Staying alive. And I think the real difference for Miner when it comes to the early first inning is that Miner's been so aggressive from the circle, getting ahead in counts and pitching for strikes early in the count because she knows that Eckert are going to take those pitches. As there's the one-two, that will be a blooper to left. Fantone plays inside and will retire the first out. But Kern Miner has been able to pitch for strikes early in the counts and has been able to get ahead because Eckert's been very disciplined, waiting and usually taking the first pitch. Interesting to see that catch by Lauren Fantone. Obviously, the book on Burge was such that Fantone had come way, way up, almost to the edge of the grass near the infield. And now, conversely, for the leadoff hitter, Lokinski, you see Lauren Fantone a good distance back from where she was, probably just a shade closer to the outfield fence, so to speak, than to the edge of the infield and so certainly they have scouting reports on all these players and this is where they feel they need to be for Brenna Lokinski. The 0-2 is taken for the 1-2 and exactly right Bruce and we just saw from that foul ball which had great contact and great sound that's the reason that Fantone's a lot deeper to make sure if that's in play she can try to get it. The 1-2 here that will be fouled away and off the roof, back down into the infield. So a good job here by Lekinski to be able to stay alive. Here with the 1-2 again for Miner. That is going to be grounded to third. The throw reaches first in time. Two away. You know, Taylor, the more this keeps up for Eckerd, meaning that they're really not be able to put together any kind of offensive threat, the more it's going to start to play on them psychologically because this is a team that got swept last weekend. Uh, on Sunday, they played the doubleheader against Lander, and they only scored one run in the two games combined. And here they are in the top of the fifth, 
and only one run, and you're going to start to wonder, where is our offense? When are we going to be able to put things together the way they did in their second game of the season? Now, mind you, they did win their first two games, but the first one they only won by 2-1. to one. The second one they won 5-1. to one. So they're trying to find their way back to that and trying to find their way back to the team that we saw in the top of the first. And that is going to be an error in the infield. And that will be a base hit for Eckerd off a good play. We saw Ballmer be able to pick it up, but whether it was like a little bit of contact with Russo or just not able to get it cleanly out of the glove, it's going well, to lead for a good single for Lore Margulis. Well, let's see how it is scored because... That could be ruled as too hot to handle, and indeed it does go down as a hit and not an error. And either way, the Tritons can exhale a little bit as they finally get a runner back on base. And now up for the Tritons is Skylar Reddish, and Reddish has one of the three Eckerd hits so far. So, as well from being in the three slot, it's the type of player one up. I was just going to say, let's see if they send Lauren Margolis, and she did have a big jump at first base. With the way the game has started to go for Eckerd, you need to get a runner in scoring position, so maybe you think about sending Lauren Margolis trying to steal a base here. So here's the 1-1, one -one. Margolis with the lead. However, it's going to be a simple play by Ballmer to second. Maybe the steal would have beaten the run to second, but the side is still retired and will now enter the bottom half of the fifth inning. And, you know, if you're Corinne Miner in that case, you see that ball that wasn't handled in time and you get a runner aboard and you just say it's only one run, she's only at first, we've got two outs, and you just settle in confidently like she did with that batter. And it's a thing of the past. You don't even remember that it happened. And that's going to happen over the course of a long season. You're going to have batted balls like that that just aren't fielded cleanly, runners that get on base. It's how quickly can you get out of the inning and minimize the damage and that's exactly what she was able to do and put herself in a position to get her team back up to bat we're going to see the seven eight nine hitters now coming up in the bottom of the fifth lexi chevalier emily jansen and steph balmer and again keep in mind that you know that was actually because it was scored a hit that was the third hit of the game for eckard and for all that has seemed to go right for tampa they only have two hits this whole game so the spartans Lady Luck can only smile on them so long. Eventually, they need to start finding some more offense to give themselves a little bit of breathing room here. And we saw that happen in one of the earlier games, Bruce, where Tampa was able to hold on to a one-hit, one-run lead because there was a walk, two stolen bases, and a hit that was able to bring a run home. But then they went and conceded three in the seventh inning and ultimately took home a 3-1 defeat. So Tampa is going to want to avoid the same fate here. And Lexi Chevalier will have the duty of trying to break down this Eckerd offense. And just a quick little pitching stats for Hannah Perkins. Perkins has pitched four innings so far with two hits allowed, one walk, two strikeouts, and only 40 pitches. For comparison, Kern Miner was entering 40 pitches in the second inning. So again, the true pace of play differential. Tampa a lot more aggressive, which can help them get those big base hits, but also makes things go a lot faster. So Perkins, very energetic, very energized, and not fatigued at all. That one's going to be taken outside for 1-0. and You know, all my years working in sports, I've met a lot of people who really don't like statistics, and they just are so bothered by some of these things that we're talking about. But it does come into play eventually, because when you have a doubleheader tomorrow, and you know that in all likelihood... Corinne Miner is going to pitch again. You'd really rather not see her throwing as many pitches as she has tonight, never mind the fact that there's still a couple more innings to go. So these things do come into play because I think the argument is who cares how many pitches she throws, it's the scoreboard that counts the most, but you don't want it to take its toll on her, especially when you get into where you're playing maybe four games in a weekend if you've got a game on Sunday also. Thankfully for Tampa, they only have to worry about three. But even so, it might be a question whether Miner does play tomorrow if the pitch count just goes too high from the circle. They do have other options from Gall House and, of course, their Utah transfer, Mary Beth Feldman. And it's always good to have an extra pitcher, including one who's played Division I in softball, but just have that experience and extra arm should you need it. The 2-2 here for Chevalier. 
That is going to be a line drive foul to the right. Well, and you and I did a game already this season where we even saw, because of injury, we saw Kate DeSimone come into a game for the Spartans. So you're right, they do have some other arms, but they know that Miner is the ace of the staff, and if head coach Leslie Cantor has her way, she'd probably love to see Corinne throw this game completely and then do another one of the two games tomorrow. And because Miner is just so good from the circle, you definitely want her pitching as often as she can. And she's got such good stamina and strength that you can sometimes risk a second game out from the next day. Well, Either. Corinne Miner is such a gamer that we've seen that in the games that she's not pitching or in the case of a game that we saw where she got pulled, she still ended up playing in the infield anyways. And that will be fouled away. Alexi Chevalier doing a great job of staying alive. But from a video game perspective, whenever you're facing Kern Miner, you're playing on hard mode. And if Kern Miner's your pitcher or your hitter, it feels like you're playing on easy mode. But the 2-2 here for Tampa's catcher here, Lexi Chevalier. The 2-2. That one is going to be a flare to center field, but it will be taken by the second base player, Sotorakis, who will retire the first out. Lexi Chevalier, obviously disappointed. Heading back to the dugout, she's 0 for 2 now in this game, and Emily Jansen comes to the plate, and we've talked about before that she holds the distinction of being the tallest player in the Spartan lineup at exactly 6 foot 0. And she is also 0 for 1 in this game. Popped out to short back in the second inning. Emily Jansen's able to foul it away. So the 0 and 1 here for Emily Jansen. And as you mentioned, Emily Jansen, one of the taller Spartans, in fact, the tallest Spartan in the softball lineup, plays so well to be able to have that reach at first base. But that height also comes with the downside of a slightly larger strike zone to have to worry about. The old one here, that'll be taken outside. One and one. Yeah, way outside, in fact. And Hannah Perkins still getting the job done, though, as we have not seen any runs up on the board since the first inning ended. And since the first inning, Tampa hasn't even gotten a hit either. Not even really a walk. Perkins has completely been composed and lethal from the mound. And I know Perkins will be the first one disappointed if Eckerd can't find any more offense. So, because apart from that first inning, she's been perfect from the circle. She's ahead in the count here against Emily Jansen. So, one and two count for Perkins from the circle, still on fire. Jansen trying to cool her off. The one-two. That is going to be taken up high and checked up just in time. Ball two. That looked like a rise, and Emily Jansen wasn't buying it. And as a result, she's got a two-two coming at her. And that is a line drive past the second baseman. And a great play by the second base player in Sotorakis. Sotorakis has already made some crazy plays so far. But... That time, unfortunately for her and the Tritons, Tampa finally gets a runner on base once again. Yeah, really well hit ball by Emily Jansen there, well placed. And so the Spartans finally get a base runner. As you see Steph Ballmer come to the plate, 0 for 1 so far in this game, struck out back in the second. And certainly UT would love to get back to the top of the order here and have one or more runners in scoring position and if they can get Balmer on base and then see about trying to move some of them around. Balmer takes strike one right here and a an 0-1-1 count. And on that last play, so great effort. Whenever you have an infielder that shows the effort that you see from Sotorakis, you can always be confident that nine times out of ten that play will be able to be made. Now I had said let's see if Eckerd would try to steal in the last inning. Let's see if the Spartans go for it here. I'm wondering if maybe that's why Steph Ballmer showed Bunt there to get Eckerd focused more on her than what Emily Jansen's doing on the base paths. 
and maybe open up an opportunity for a stolen base. So let's keep an eye out for that as the count goes to one and two. And with a one and two, have to see if Jansen goes and moves. So keep an eye out both on the batter and also on the runner. That one's fouled away though. Jansen didn't go. But you saw her there at the very start of that, showing bunt and then taking it back. So trying to get into the heads a little bit of Eckerd. That's going to be important as well. It's as much a physical game as a mental game. The one-two here. Jansen doesn't go in. Stir strike three. It is another strikeout for Perkins. Right. He was recovered after that Number strong hit to record a strong strikeout. Perkins. But now the pressure's on. Perkins has been absolutely lethal as a batter so far. 0-2 oh, tonight. Or for the season? Has hit near 500 ball. And it's proven to be a very solid leadoff option for the Spartans. So Perkins from the circle has to worry about possible steal from Jansen. That's going to be grounded. And oh, a little bit of contact there. Interference. And that'll be interference. Yep. So the side is retired. Jansen's still down after that. And that's the unfortunate thing. If you have a ball that goes into the base path, sometimes you'll have a collision like that. Jansen looks okay. She's back up and moving. Possibly just knocked the wind out of her. And ultimately, that will end the fifth inning. I pledge. I pledge. I pledge. I, pledge. I am an NCAA student athlete. And I pledge to be a champion of unity on my team, on my campus, and in my community. I pledge to embrace differences and strive for inclusion and collaboration. I pledge to stand against racism, hate, and discrimination. I pledge to strive for love, care, and forgiveness. I pledge to stand against silence, deceit, and obscurity. I pledge to strive for dialogue, truth, and understanding. I pledge to stand against fear and doubt. I pledge to strive for trust and belief in one another. I pledge to stand against complacency and stagnancy. I pledge to strive for change and growth. I commit to supporting my fellow student athletes in all circumstances that impact them. I commit to both choosing unity personally and encouraging it for all. I pledge these things because we are stronger together. United, United as, as one. And we are back, top of the sixth inning. It is still 2-1, Spartans lead. Last inning, we saw two hits, one for each team. Both times, the runner got stranded, including off the interference last time. Emily Jansen, unfortunately, had a collision with Sarah Sotorakis, but both were okay. And to lead off for Eckerd will be... So here it is, it's going to be taken. And I think that's 2 0 or 1 0. Either way, still ahead in the count is Eckerd, and that will be taken for another ball. And it is going to be a 3 0 count. A potential leadoff walk here that could be drawn for Eckerd. The 3 0 pitch that is going to be taken inside and ball four. So for Kayla Hurley, that's two walks now. She had walked in the third. And again, if you're Eckerd, you love seeing your leadoff hitter get on base. And now we're going to have a conference here in the pitching circle as Leslie Cantor comes out to talk with Corinne Miner. And you have to wonder, Taylor, the pitch count all the way up to 98 for Corinne Miner. And, and is Leslie Cantor possibly considering to make a change? I guess not since she's walking away, but certainly telling her team, look, let's retire the side here. Let's try to get two if we can, get, get rid of that base runner and wrap this game up because this is a lot, a lot of work, a lot of wear and tear on Corinne Miner's arm. And that's going to be what they're going to want here, Bruce. And with a runner on first, they're also now going to have to worry about that tying run potentially coming home. It's going to come down to Cardona here with the 0 pitch. Cardona will lay down a bunt, picked up cleanly and out in time. That is a great reaction there from Siegel to make the play. 
The runner does advance to second, though. So the sacrifice does its job and nearly beat out the throw, but was out by about a step. Yeah, really good, really good bunt. Really good bunt there by Eckerd, and you get the desired result in the form of a runner on second base now. And, you know, I, I say that also because it was a close enough play at first that, that that's the kind of timing you're looking for offensively and no, no opportunity for UT to, to try to get the lead runner. So now Kayla Hurley, as you mentioned, is the tying run, and she's on second. Makes a big difference. And that one is taken outside for ball one. And exactly that. And with the runner on second, any ball in play not only advances the runner to third, but if you get to the outfield, that potentially sends it home. Speaking of balls to the outfield, that one's going to go deep but foul. Fantone, what a run to be able to corral it. Runner tags up and reaches third. Nearly goes off the bag, but comes back in time. So Fantone, we mentioned she had the legs earlier to get one of the foul balls that just went way too far left. That time, it stays in, and she picks it up. Unfortunately, though, what happened there is as good a play as Fantone made. When she sent the relay in, I'm not sure that Steph Ballmer realized that there was a very real opportunity to try to get Hurley at third, and just that bit of hesitation made the difference, and now all of a sudden Eckert finds themselves with the tying run at third. Indeed, and I will say, though, the fact that it was a potential play at third from all the way deep in left field in foul territory is great effort there from Fantone to not only track down the foul ball, but to also bring it in so quick. That one's going to be taken for the 0-1. But two outs here. Kern Miner could get out of this jam. That one's going to be taken outside for ball one. That pitch count is now well over 100 for Kern Miner. Yeah, I was just going to say they're going to have a nice big bag of ice waiting to wrap around her shoulder when this game ends. And that is going to be a fly to center field. Gullhouse gets under it, and the side is retired. The runner is stranded on third, not able to bring the tying run home to end the top of the sixth. Tampa's bats now come up for potentially the final time to try to get some more offense going. Yeah, what a shot in the arm that is for the Spartans to be able to get out of that inning and leave Eckerd with a runner stranded at third and come up to the plate knowing that they could, for all intents and purposes, potentially put the game out of reach because other than that, what we just saw in that half inning, Eckerd has really not been able to muster anything offensively, so you got to have some confidence coming to the plate here in the bottom of the six for the Spartans and say, let's put this game out of reach and then let's shut them out in the top of the seventh and call it a night. It's going to be down to Perkins to see whether Tampa can get any offense going. Yeah, we're going to see Fantone, Gelhaus, and Miner. So you, essentially you have them right where you want them. If, if you're the Spartans looking at the fact that you've got your two, three, and four hitters coming to the plate and say, if we're going to do any damage, you got to put your money on. These are going to be the ladies that are going to do it for us. Although it's also worth noting that Fantone and Miner have two of Tampa's three hits in this game. So you start to feel even better about yourself and say, as much as we've not had our hitting shoes on tonight, at least two of the three that have been able to get a base hit are due up at the plate in this half inning. So let's see how UT does here in the bottom of the sixth as you see Lauren Fantone stepping into the batter's box now. And a look back into the first inning, as you mentioned, Fantone with one of the three hits. Well, that hit was good for three bases on a beautiful triple up in the gap by the wall. If it was any further or any harder to field, it could have been an inside the park home run. But that wasn't the case. Fantone, however, a chance to try to get back up there. DOL. Fantone with a line drive that just goes straight foul. And you mentioned that Corinne Miner is over 100 pitches. By comparison, you look at Hannah Perkins, she's only at 59. So quite a contrast in the pitching circle tonight in terms of the amount of work that one or the other has or has not done. The 0 one that'll be fouled away here for 0-2 count now for Fantone. And taking a look, if you've only pitched around 60 or so pitches by the end of the game, it's very feasible that if needed, Perkins could go back into the circle for a leaf in for an inning or two if she needed. 
but probably not the case if you've already got like 110 for current minor. That's fouled away. Fantone keeps the at-bat alive, still low on two. And evening has turned tonight. The lights lighting up the field of play for the Tampa Spartans. And Necker Triton's here in the Moley Family Stadium. And the 0-2 from Perkins from the circle. Strike three. That is another strong strikeout on the riser. It's fooled multiple Tampa Spartans tonight. Yeah, a real nice pitch there from Hannah Perkins getting Fantone to chase. And so Perkins is doing just about everything she can from the pitching circle and now she'll go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Mariah Galhaus, who walked back in the first inning and then lined out to second in the third. Exactly that. Galhaus got on base, stole a base, and was able to go home on a double. That's going to be a fly to center field and an easily recorded out for Hannah Burge. Two away in the bottom of the sixth, and it brings up Kern Minor. The last chance to give any sort of run support for the Spartans. And we said it before, but it bears repeating. Corinne Miner has provided all the run support for herself, courtesy of a two RBI double back in the first inning. And obviously she would love to pad her own lead here with this at bat. And certainly for the Tritons, it goes without saying, looking to close things out and try to get UT one, two, three in this bottom of the sixth so they can get themselves at least a tie in the top of the seventh. So Miner takes the first pitch, but it's called strike one. We'll also take the second pitch. It's called ball one. And Perkins has four strikeouts and under 70 pitches. A great job from the circle apart from that double from Miner in the first inning. There's a drive by Miner to center field, but the side will be retired as Burge goes away with it. Well, that's finished the sixth inning, and now the top of the seventh will be due up. Eckerd, the final chance to try to tie it up. Well, it all comes down to this the as we saw. Of the seventh and the last chance saloon for the Eckerd Tritons. After a very good first inning for them, they've come up nearly empty throughout the rest of the game. Kern Miner has been an ace from the circle, as always. But now, the bottom of the lineup in order, eight, nine, and one. Sotorakis will be leading off as a potential tying run for the Tritons. And we saw head coach Katie Prophet walks out of Rockus to the batter's box and final words of encouragement, a pat on the back and hoping to see her team come through here offensively in the top of the seventh. It's now or never as Eckerd's bats have for all intents and purposes fallen silent since back in the first inning. And that will be fouled away for strike two. And indeed, it's been silent on the score sheet completely from that first inning for Curran Miner. She's going to hope from the circle that that doesn't change and it stays scoreless for the top of the seventh. Already has the 0-2 on Sotorakis. And that will be a fly ball that Chevalier can't get. 
So we'll have to go it again. It's still 0-2. Unfortunate that Lexi Chevalier was not able to get to that pop out, or excuse me, to that pop fly because Spartans would love to already have one down here and bring up the number nine header and potentially get out number two, but Sotoraka stays alive. And, and now she's not. strike three. It looked like that Sotoraka is was able to take the ball, but he just was on the edge of the zone, the umpire ruled, for another strikeout for Kern Miner. That'll be number four of the day. And now, and now we'll one see out Hannah Burge, seven. and Hannah Burge, the number nine hitter. Obviously, pressure moment here, and you know, you like to see your players in these pressure moments. How do they react? And do they cave into the pressure? Do they respond well? And this is certainly one of those moments for Hannah Burge here in the top of the seventh with her team trailing two to one and already one out. The low outside corner is where that pitch lands for strike one. Burge does a good job taking it, but now even in the count one and one. And as you were mentioning, in Bruce, that's a high pressure situation. Gets the ball down. It's going to be a ground out, two outs. And now Lukinski is going to be back up for the potential final out of the game, the final batter up here for Eckerd. All the pressure now on her shoulders. I'll tell you what, Steph Ballmer wasted no time at all getting that ball over to first base. She wanted to make absolutely sure that that was gonna be out number two. Here's the old pitch that's gonna be taken for strike one. Kern Miner able to get ahead in the count, trying to finish up this game without any drama from the circle. The 0-1 here. That one's going to be taken for ball one, just a little too high. You know, Eckerd has three hits in this game. They've all come from their one, two, and three hitters. So they already know that Lekinski is is capable against Corinne Miner. She just needs to repeat it. That one's going to be taken outside for ball two. And a great eye there from Lekinski to be able to try to get ahead in the count. That's what... Eckert are going to need if they want to keep the inning alive and keep the game alive. The 2 1 here. That one is going to be fouled away, so 2 2. Let's see what Corinne Miner brings here. She obviously knows that she's one pitch away from ending the game. And you don't want to open the door at all for Eckert at this point. The 2-2 two -two fouled away, and Lekinski is going to be able to keep it alive here. It is still a 2-2 two -two count with two outs, a 2-1 Tampa lead, and the number 22, Kern Miner, trying to close out another complete game. 2-2. Two -two. That's going to be lined and caught by Palmer, and that is the game. Tampa wins game one of the three-game series, and we will see you tomorrow when Tampa faces off against Eckerd at home in a double header. And so with this victory, Tampa goes to six and three overall, one loss record on the season. And unfortunately for Eckerd, as I mentioned earlier in the broadcast, they were coming off of a double header sweep on Sunday when they had only scored one run in the two games combined. And now here they come out tonight and not only lose their third in a row, but they only get one run again. So they certainly need to get a good night's sleep and think about this game here and what they're going to do differently tomorrow to try to find some offense as they play back-to-back -back games in the afternoon against the Spartans. That's exactly what they're going to have to do. They had a great start there, but Miner, I think, was able to adjust and say, they're taking a lot of pitches. I need to be more aggressive. And once she started to do that, she started to be able to get the at-bats she wanted and was able to close out a great game. So the final line score, the Eckerd Tritons finish up with one run on three hits, no errors, and the Spartans two runs on three hits and no errors, and the home team sends their fans home happy with a two-to-one victory. The away fans, a little bit disappointed, but happy to see a fun game. We will see you tomorrow. I've been Taylor Storthy alongside Bruce Wor Worsniak, and we will see you tomorrow.